everyone. Thanks for joining us again today for our chapter book story time. I'm Miss Erin and we are continuing to read Little Women by Louisa May Alcott here for our story time at the Caribou Public Library. So we're on chapter 12 which is called Camp Lawrence and we are going to read the first half today. Camp Lawrence. Beth was postmistress for, being most at home, she could attend to it regularly and dearly liked the daily task of unlocking the little door and distributing the mail. One July day, she came in with her hands full and went about the house leaving letters and parcels like the penny post. Here's your posy, mother. Laurie never forgets that, she said, putting the fresh nosegay in the vase that stood in Marmy's corner and was kept supplied by the affectionate boy. So he brought flowers pretty much every day, huh? Miss Meg March, one letter and a glove, continued Beth, delivering the articles to her sister, who sat near her mother, stitching wristbands. Why, I left a pair over there, and here is only one, said Meg, looking at the gray cotton glove. Didn't you drop the other in the garden? No, I'm sure I didn't, for there was only one in the office. I hate to have odd gloves. Never mind, the other may be found. My letter is only a translation of the German song I wanted. I guess Mr. Brooke did it for this isn't Laurie's writing. Mrs. March glanced at Meg, who was looking very pretty in her gingham morning gown with the little curls blowing about her forehead and very womanly as she sat sewing at her little work table, full of tidy white rolls. So unconscious of the thought in her mother's mind, she sewed and sung while her fingers flew and her mind was busied with girlish fancies as innocent and fresh as the pansies in her belt that Mrs. March smiled and was satisfied. Two letters for Dr. Joe, a book and a funny old hat, which covered the whole post office stuck outside, said Beth laughing as she went into the study where Joe sat writing. What a sly fellow Laurie is. I said I wished bigger hats were in fashion because I burn my face every hot day. He said, why mind the fashion, wear a big hat and be comfortable. I said I would if I had one and he has sent me this to try me. I'll wear it for fun and show him I don't care for the fashion. And hanging the antique broad brim on a bust of Plato, Jo read her letters. One from her mother made her cheeks glow and her eyes fill, for it said to her, My dear, I write a little word to tell you with how much satisfaction I watch your efforts to control your temper. You say nothing about your trials, failures, or successes, and think perhaps that no one sees them. But the friend, capital F, friend, whose help you daily ask, if I may trust the well-worn cover of your guidebook, I too have seen them all and heartily believe in the sincerity of your resolution, since it begins to bear, to bear fruit. Go on, dear, patiently and bravely, and believe always that no one sympathizes more tenderly with you than your loving mother. That does me good. That's worth millions of money and pecks of praise. Oh, Marmy, I do try. I will keep on trying and not get tired since I have you to help me. Laying her head on her arms, Jo wet her little romance with a, little, with a few happy tears, for she had thought that no one saw and appreciated her efforts to be good. And this assurance was doubly precious, doubly encouraging, because unexpected and from the person whose commendation she most valued. Feeling stronger than ever to meet and subdue her Apollyon, she pinned the note aside inside her frock as a shield and a reminder lest she be taken unaware and proceeded to open her other letter, quite ready for either good or bad news. In a big dashing hand, Laurie wrote, Dear Joe, what ho, some English girls and boys are coming to see me tomorrow and I want to have a jolly time. If it's fine, I'm going to pitch my tent in Long Meadow and row up the whole crew to lunch and croquet, have a fire, make messes, gypsy fashion, and all sorts of larks. They're nice people and like such things. Brooke will go to keep us boys steady and Kate Vaughn will play propriety for the girls. I want you all to come. Can't let Beth off at any price and nobody shall worry her. Don't bother about rations. I'll see to that and everything else. Only do come. There's a good fellow. In a tear tearing hurry, yours ever, Laurie. Here's a richness, cried Joe, flying in to tell the news to Meg. Of course we can go, mother. It will be such a help to Laurie, for I can row and beg to see the lunch and the children to be useful in some way. I hope the Vaughns are not fine, grown-up people, 
Do you know anything about them, Joe? asked Meg. Only that there are four of them. Kate is older than you, Fred and Frank are twins, about my age, and a little girl, Grace, who is nine or ten. Laurie knew them abroad and liked the boys, I fancied, from the way he primmed up his mouth in speaking of her that he didn't admire Kate much. I'm so glad my, fr my French print is clean. It's just the thing and so becoming, observed Meg complacently. Have you anything decent, Joe? Scarlet and gray boating suit. Good enough for me. I shall row and tramp about so I don't want any starch to think of. You'll come, Betty? If you won't let any of the boys talk to me. Not a boy. I like to please Laurie, and I'm not afraid of Mr. Brooke. He is so kind, but I don't want to play or sing or anything. I'll work hard and not trouble anyone, and you'll take, you'll take care of me, so I'll go. Hmm. That's my good girl. You do try to fight off your shyness, and I love you for it. Fighting faults isn't easy, as I know, and a cheery word kind of gives a lift. Thank you, Mother. And Joe gave the thin cheek a grateful kiss, more precious to Mrs. March than if it had given her back the rosy roundness of her youth. I had a box of chocolate drops and the picture I wanted to copy, said Amy, showing her mail. And I got a note from Mr. Lawrence asking me to come over and play to him tonight before the lamps are lighted. And I shall go, added Beth whose friendship with the old gentleman prospered finely. Now let's fly around and do double duty today so that we can play tomorrow with free minds, said Jo, preparing to replace her pen with a broom. When the sun peeped into the girl's room early next morning to promise them a fine day, he saw a comical sight. Each had made such preparation for the fete as seemed necessary and proper. Meg had an extra row of little curl papers across her forehead. Joe had copiously anointed her afflicted face with cold cream. Beth had taken Joanna to bed with her to atone for the approaching separation. And Amy had capped the climax by putting a clothespin on her nose to uplift the offending feature. It was one of the kind artists used to hold the paper on their drawing boards, therefore quite appropriate and effective for the purpose to which it was now put on. This funny spectacle appeared to amuse the sun, for he burst out with such radiance that Joe woke up and roused all her sisters by a hearty laugh at Amy's ornament. Sunshine and laughter were good omens for a pleasure party, and soon a lively bustle began in both houses. Beth, who was ready first, kept reporting what went on next door and enlivened her sister's toilets by frequent telegrams from the window. There goes the man with the tent. I see Mrs. Barker doing up the lunch in a hamper and a great basket. Now Mr. Lawrence is looking up at the sky and the weathercock. I wish he would go too. There's Laurie looking like a sailor. Nice boy. Oh, mercy me. Here's a carriage full of people, a tall lady, a little girl, and two dreadful boys. One is lame, poor thing. He's got a crutch. Laurie didn't tell us that. Be quick, girls. It's getting late. Why, there is Ned Moffat. I do declare. Look, Meg, isn't that the man who bowed bowed to you one day when we were shopping. So it is. How queer that he should come. I thought he was at the mountains. There's Sally. I'm glad she got back in time. Am I all right, Joe? cried Meg in a flutter. A regular daisy. Hold up your dress and put on your hat straight. It looks sentimental tipped that way. And we'll fly off at the first puff. Now then, come on. Oh, Joe, you ain't going to wear that awful hat. It's too absurd. You shall not make a guy of yourself, remonstrated Meg as Joe tied down with a red ribbon the broad-brimmed, old-fashioned leghorn Laurie had sent for a joke. I just will, though. It's capital, so shady, light, and big. It will make fun, and I don't mind becoming a guy if I'm comfortable. With that, Joe marched straight away, and the rest followed, a bright little band of sisters all looking their best in summer suits with happy faces under the jaunty hat brims. Laurie ran to meet and present them to his friends in the most cordial manner. The lawn was the reception room, and for several minutes a lively scene was enacted there. Meg was grateful to see that Miss Kate, though twenty, was dressed with a simplicity which American girls would do well to imitate, and she was much flattered by Mr. Ned's assurances that he came especially to see her. Joe understood why Laurie primmed up his mouth when speaking of Kate for that young lady had a standoff don't touch me air, which contrasted strongly with the free and easy demeanor of the other girls. 
Beth took an observation of the new boys and decided that the lame one was not dreadful, but gentle and feeble, and he would be kind to him on that account. Amy found Grace, a well-mannered, merry little person, and after staring dumbly at one another for a few minutes, they suddenly became very good friends. Tents, lunch, and croquet utensils having been set on beforehand, the party was soon embarked, and the two boats pushed off together, leaving Mr. Lawrence waving his hat on the shore. Lori and Joe rowed one boat, Mr. Brooke and Ned the other, while Fred Vaughn, the riotous twin, did his best to upset both by paddling about in a weary, like a disturbed water bug. Joe's funny hat deserved a vote of thanks, for it was a general it was of general utility. It broke the ice in the beginning by producing a laugh. It created quite a refreshing breeze, flapping to and fro <laughs> as she rode, and would make an excellent umbrella for the whole party if a shower came up she said. Kate looked rather amazed at Joe's proceedings, especially as she exclaimed, Christopher Columbus, when she lost her oar, and Laurie said, my dear fellow, did I hurt you, when he tripped over her feet in taking his place. But after putting up her glass to examine the queer girl several times, Miss Kate decided that she was odd but rather clever, and smiled upon her from afar. Meg, in the other boat, was delightfully situated face to face with the rowers, who both admired the prospect and feathered their oars with uncommon skill and dexterity. Mr. Brooke was a grave, silent young man with handsome brown eyes and a pleasant voice. Meg liked his quiet manners and considered him a walking encyclopedia of useful knowledge. He never talked to her much, but he looked at her a good deal and she felt sure that he did not regard her with aversion. Ned, being in college, of course put on all the airs which freshmen think it their bounden duty to assume. He was not very wise, but very good-natured and merry, and altogether an excellent person to carry on a picnic. Sally Gardner was absorbed in keeping her white peak dress clean and chattering with the ubiquitous Fred, who kept Beth in constant terror by his pranks. Now that's the end of where we are going to be reading today. We'll continue on with the rest of their um, adventure and picnic next time. You guys have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.